Yeah. Thanks, Arlie, and uh, welcome everyone to this month's episode of Coffee and Compliance. Uh, this is your host, Jamie Leupold, Director of Channels and Alliances here at Prevail, and I'm a CCP. And uh, joining me this month is Marcy Womack from Shellman. And Marcy, I'll, I'll let you um, introduce yourself to the crowd, but very excited to have Marcy with us this month. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, everyone. I am Marcy Womack. I am a managing director in our federal practice here at Shellman. So I oversee kind of the, the FedRAMP arm of our practice, as well as the CMMC arm, handling all of the breaking news um, and or waiting game as it relates to CMMC. Um, so look forward to talking through the relationship of both of these areas with you today. Thanks, Marcy, and uh, really excited to have Marcy this month in particular, because this month's focus is going to be on uh, a really hot topic right now that, that I'm getting a lot of inquiries from our partners and our customers about, and that is FedRAMP moderate equivalency, specifically for cloud service providers slash cloud service offerings. Um, thought it would be great to have uh, someone like Marcy join us this month, because she has the unique perspective of not only being a C3PAO, but also a 3PAO. So she can kind of talk about uh, what FedRAMP moderate equivalency means both for, for customers as well as other cloud service providers. Uh, and of course, Prevail uh, being at the forefront of FedRAMP moderate equivalency, you know, be happy to share our journey as well. So a lot of great information to share this month. I'm excited to share that with you. Um, just before I get started, as always, it is coffee and compliance. So uh, I'm Got my coffee mug here. This is Treehouse. Uh, if you're from the Northeast or, or have been here, you may have heard of Treehouse Brewery. Uh, they also do coffee. Um, this is strictly coffee, not uh, not drinking on the job. In fact, I'm actually celebrated dry January, but I'm, I'm extending that into late March this year. So a new personal record for me. Uh, but enough about me and my coffee. Marcy, what do you got over there? Um, I just have... The, the usual Nespresso Intenso. Um, I always say the darker the coffee, the closer to God. And it's in like a handmade mug that I got from a trip to Maine, so. Perfect. Not not far from uh, from where I live. Totally. Orly, you mind uh, pulling some slides up? We can go ahead and get started. And uh, please do, if you have any questions, use the Q&A feature to ask uh, any questions. We have some that have come in that we'll be getting to, um, but we're always happy to answer questions. Um, anything CMMC, DFARS, NIST, ITAR related, uh, the, the focus this month is federal moderate equivalency, but the questions don't have to be um, solely around that. Um, so we already covered introductions. Marcy, uh, I think you'll kind of take us through the, the difference between FedRAMP and CMMC and what do folks need to pay attention to, as well as your thoughts on the FedRAMP moderate equivalent memo. Um, and then I'm going to finish up by, by covering, you know, Prevail's specific journey uh, to FedRAMP moderate equivalency, obviously how this impacts our customers, our partners, you know, what we've gone through to date. Um, and if we have any other CSP or uh, prospective CSPs on the line, they'll have some idea of, you know, what they're in store for as well. Um, so with that said, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Marcy. Awesome. Thank you. So I always find it's helpful to start this conversation. Um, well, I will tell you a little bit about Shellman if you don't know. Um, we are a um, cybersecurity assessment firm. Um, we are headquartered out of Tampa, Florida. We have a very remote workforce. Um, we specialize in doing um, attestation work, compliance assessments, gap assessments um, across uh, CMMC, FedRAMP, anything related to, to NIST 853-171, and then as well as SOC, High Trust, HIPAA, PCI, ISO, uh, the list goes on. So you can uh, reach, research us if, if you're unfamiliar with us. And if we go to the next slide, Orly, I'll kind of focus um, kind of just a little bit more about us there. Um, so kind of how we came to be involved in CMMC is directly related to our FedRAMP experience. So uh, we are the number one provider of FedRAMP assessments on the FedRAMP marketplace. Um, we were one of the first authorized C3 PAOs. Um, we were the fifth and we were the first assessment firm that was authorized. So that's our primary focus. Um, we've done a ton of NIST 800-171 assessments. And then we've also participated in um, many of the joint surveillance assessments that have happened for DIB organizations kind of in that like stand up of CMMC and kind of that ramp up there. So obviously covering just a few of our key offerings all related to uh, pending certification assessment once we're actually authorized to do that by um, the final rule as well as the kind of 
go ahead from the cyber AB, um, as well as, of course, uh, various 171 gap assessments, compliance assessments related to CMMC, um, the FedRAMP side, and anything that's kind of federal adjacent, um, just covering that. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about Shellman. And from there, I'm just going to kind of jump into uh, some of the distinctions. Marcy, just between... real quick, just for our audience, I, I think just a, a point of emphasis that, that I think is important to mention um, is that Shellman's a bit unique in that you were an assessment firm that was doing a lot of assessment work and, and are now transitioning to CMMC, whereas a lot of C3PAOs, CMMC is, is kind of their, their first foray into assessing, and they're typically consultants, or we've seen some that are MSPs. Um, so I think it's important just for folks, if they want any help from Shellman, um, you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't provide really consulting services, right? It's purely assessment. If they want to get assessed, gap assessments, things like that. Um, but you're not going to go and fix anything. You're not going to help with remediation or anything like that. Absolutely. And thanks for keeping me honest and make sure I cover that, of course. Um, Jamie's correct. Um, we we do assessment only, and that's across our entire firm, but obviously applies here to CMMC. So when we think about um, the types of assessments that we perform, even a gap assessment, we're always going to come in with the assessor's perspective. Um, we're going to write um, detailed findings so you can derive what makes sense to kind of remediate that. We actually wouldn't give you any direct recommendations. Um, we wouldn't actually, we wouldn't certainly help you with any of the remediation efforts there. You would, you know, want to partner with either go internal with the expertise that you all have or partner with an external um, advisory firm for, for any of that. So. Great. Awesome. Um, are we ready to kind of jump into the, yeah. okay, cool. So the um, topic of the day. Yeah, I know, right? Um, I, I, I talk about this a lot, obviously, but, um, you know, FedRAMP and CMMC kind of get often thrown into the conversation together, and I, I think it's helpful to understand the relationship between the two and also some distinct differences. So FedRAMP is focused on cloud service providers, and when we think about CMMC um, and where it derived from, which is the state 171, as well as the directives in DFAR 7012, um, DFAR 7012 is, is very clear on saying, hey, if you're cloud, you need to go over here and do FedRAMP. But if you're not, then you need to focus on 171. And so CMMC follows that same type of, of divergence. And so, um, you know, FedRAMP is specific to a cloud service offering. And um, that is defined in a NIST document. It's NIST 800-145. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, recommend that you, you take a look. Um, and then, of course, there are many nuances to, to FedRAMP. But how it relates to CMMC is that you know, an organization that does have a CMMC requirement or does want to go through that certification process, there are now requirements saying if you're using a cloud service provider um, in, you know, the operation and the handling of this contractor CUI, then that cloud service provider needs to be FedRAMP authorized or FedRAMP equivalent. And that phrasing actually came from DFAR 7012. And it's existed since about 2016, 2017, um, but we've never really had a definition for what equivalency means. And so with all of the kind of breaking news in the last six to seven weeks um, around equivalency, we finally got a definition for that. And so um, we'll, I'm sure we'll circle back to some of these kind of like definition type points, but I did wanna lay the groundwork um, just on, on some of the differences there. Um, Jamie, would you like me to, to go into some of the, the finer points of the uh, equivalency memo? Yeah, I, I think Perfect. it's important for folks to hear, you know, kind of your unique perspective from both the 3PAO, if you're working with other CSPs versus if you're, let's say, assessing a customer, um, what you would expect, you know, maybe an OSC to present if they're going through a JSVA or, you know, what you're maybe hearing from DIPCAC, what they're looking for as, as they go through that process. Um, you know, I, I think when you look at the the body of evidence that's found in the memo, it, it's an onerous and it, it's a lot of information. Um, you know, as I'll share later, our body of evidence is is close to 2,000 pages. So for the average, uh, you know, customer, that they're not possibly going to be able to review all that, nor would they want to review all that. Um, so maybe just helping people understand, you know, what to look for. Um, you know, is, is kind of a minimum threshold for, okay, this CSP, this cloud service provider is probably on the right path, you know, I think would make some sense. Definitely. So 
Um, in reading through the equivalency memo, you know, to all of the documentation, Jamie, to your point, that's required, the good news is that all of that is, is very standard in a federal assessment. So we don't see any discrepancy there between the deliverables that as a FedRAMP 3PAO, we would either be responsible for producing like the security assessment plan, the security assessment report, and all of the, the subcomponents to those sections, but um, where the cloud service provider would be responsible for the system security plan and all of the very um, many hundreds, thousands of pages that go into kind of that whole package. Um, I was pleased to see that there, that there was parity really between what we would expect from on the FedRAMP side to what we see with equivalency. Um, so it is a ton of documentation, but it is what you would be expected to do if you were going for full FedRAMP authorization. Um, one thing that's certainly interesting, and you know, I know folks have really focused on in the discussion around the equivalency memo is um, around the idea of 100% compliance. And so I've, I've really studied this and, and thought about it. Um, and I mean, frankly, like, when requiring 100% 100 compliance here is not really, it's, a, it's above federal equivalency because there are very, very, very few CSPs, um, and Jamie would love for you to speak to this in a few minutes, who, who come out of an assessment with zero findings and with zero POAMs. And so it, it puts um, the CSP and perhaps the 3PO and, and really all of the stakeholders involved in a little bit of an awkward position because um, you, know, document, you, you have a, a 500 page SSP there's probably gonna be something off in that SSP. It's impossible to keep up with and have 100% accurate 100% of the time. So as a 3PAO, do we, do we lessen our analysis of the system security plan and not issue a related finding? Just so if that's the only one you have left. So, I mean, we could really go down many rabbit holes with you know, this whole discussion, but I did wanna point out that the idea of 100% compliance is a really high bar. We, we, if, if we ever see it, it's extremely rare on the FedRAM side. And so I, I found that to be really interesting. And, and I, you know, it, it's based on this idea, you know, FedRAMP is a risk management program. Um, and the way that DOD is viewing CMMC in this case, it, it's not really built that way. You know, within CMMC, there's the idea of 100% compliance within that 180 days. So let's say you're going, an organization's going through a um, certification assessment and there are a few findings that are within the thresholds. And so you would have 180 days to remediate that in order to get the certification um, in like a final state. And so, you know, that's carrying over into this idea of FedRAMP equivalency, but it is slightly a higher bar than what we typically see on the FedRAMP side. Um, yeah, and they're not giving us the, the 180 days either yeah. to remedy any POAMs. It's, you go back and, and you get reassessed in, in front of DIBCAC. But yeah, I'll, I'll talk about a, a little bit more about our journey and okay. you know what we've accomplished, which I, I think is pretty unique. But you're right. The, we thought we were setting the bar high when we were in discussions with DIBCAC and DOD about what we were going. And then the bar ended up getting set quite a bit higher than we thought. So we had to adapt pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and that's tough too, because you know sometimes there are there are nuances to FedRAMP. We always say that's one of the most difficult things to going through the process is there are kind of unwritten rules and, and that type of thing. And so it might affect system architecture. It might affect something that is just not simple to change um, when you know it's, it's gonna affect you. Um, and the other piece of this is if you've ever been involved in FedRAMP or gone through an assessment, you'll, and you can see this in the, the templates, the, the FedRAMP deliverable templates, but you know, as a 3PAO, we're required to report on the number of open vulnerabilities identified in infrastructure, container, web app, database scans. And if they are open at the time of assessment, even if they're within that SLA window, we're still required to report on them. And so there's not, in my opinion, enough clarity within this equivalency memo on how that should be handled. Um, is that what they mean by operational poems? I don't know. Um, and I, I hope that we get some clarity on that before this, you know, before we get a year into this and maybe the rules change in the middle of the game. So Marcy, if, if I'm a, a contractor today and I am contemplating using a, a federal moderate equivalent CSP, what type of documentation do you think they should be asking for um, short of, you know, hiring uh, somebody that can read through an entire BOE um, for them so that they would probably feel comfortable? What, what do you think they should be asking for? And to confirm, you're the OSC, so the OSC is is mm -hmm. looking at the C their their CSP's documentation. 
Yeah, so a couple of things. Obviously, one, make sure they have all the documents, that they're complete. Um, and, you know, I think this is part of just understanding what goes into a FedRAMP assessment. They're very arduous. Um, we spend a ton of assessor time, and we go very in-depth in our testing, but we're looking at um, everything that's in this BOE from like the SSP perspective, um, that's, that's what we're looking at. We're also actually doing the, the evidence review and the, and the testing and the testing documentation, which you would see in the test case workbook that's attached to that security assessment report or the SAR. Um, so I would, I would recommend that any OSC is saying, you know, did, a, did an accredited three FedRAM 3PAO perform this equivalency assessment? Um, you know, read through the report, understand um, if there are findings or if there were, you know, and, and read through the testing details to ensure that it really meets the, the level of risk threshold and, and tolerance that the OSC has to, to have comfort there. Um, at the end of the day, you know, like Shellman is a 3PAO, we're, we're going to approach this with the same rigor that we would in any other situation. And so, um, you know, I would say that there's, you know, some reputation um, and check the federal marketplace, you know, all those types of things. Um, but focusing on the SAR um, is probably the key point, as well as that customer responsibility matrix, the CRM, um, which is also within- and Marcy, what's the SAR, what's SAR stand for? Just for uh, those Security folks Assessment that... Report. Sorry, I, I, I've tried not to like go too far into the acronyms. It's very difficult. Um, but the customer responsibility matrix, the CRM, is really important because this is the cloud service provider telling an organization, hey, we're going to provide these inheritable controls for this, for what kind of what you're using the cloud service for. Um, but there are going to be shared controls as well, potentially. And there will also be customer responsibilities. So the OSC is responsible for perhaps um, you know, handling the authentication to this web application or, or whatever the product is. And so understanding what responsibilities are passed and shared with the OSC between the CSP, um, that is something that we would look for in a CMMC assessment. So there's kind of a, like a, a, a Venn diagram, um, a, a few different little sections where there's crossover. So maybe at, at bare minimum, if uh, if a company is contemplating a a, a federal monitored equivalent CSP before they go down the road, they should at least make sure they have a letter of attestation from a accredited federal three PAO, not to be confused with a C three PAO in the CMMC world, um, along with a, a shared responsibility matrix. Would you say those are probably the the two things to look for first before you go too far down the road? Probably, um, yes, um, those two things, because that would depend on whether it's a risk that the OSC is willing to take on. If, they, if they're comfortable with the controls that they need to implement as defined in that responsibility matrix, or if there are findings, is it a clean report? Is there 100% compliance, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing? Um, I would focus there before going and reviewing the rest of the documentation, because the part we haven't gotten to in this discussion is a section of the memo that states that the contractor is responsible for reviewing everything and ensuring that it meets like the defined standard here. And so, um, you know, in terms of not going too far and and you know using time um, wisely, starting with that security assessment report and the CRM, the responsibility matrix. And if the CSP says, well, we're you know we're hosted in AWS GovCloud, so we'll just use theirs, or we're in we're in Azure Gov, which I'm sure you hear. Uh, what's your response then? It hurts my heart. Wrong, wrong. Um, that is that is the incorrect response. Um, so, regardless of, you know, it's great that there that an offering is hosted in a FedRAMP authorized platform or infrastructure. Great because um, you know they're they're going to be able to inherit some controls from that platform or infrastructure, but. There are still many, many controls that, that the SAS or whatever that offering has to implement in the FedRAMP program to, to be FedRAMP equivalent or to obtain authorization. So um, it's helpful, but it has really no bearing on this discussion like whatsoever. Great. No, thank you. Yeah, thanks for providing that clarity because we do hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've, we've covered a fair amount. I know we've got some questions and, and I did want to... Um, just kind of highlight Prevail's um, journey to federal moderate equivalency. We, we've kind of been at the, the forefront of this, working closely with DOD and, and DIVCAC for you know over a year now. Um, we've really been pushing them to get this defined, and they've even mentioned that in, in some discussions with us. 
Um, Orly, would you mind just bringing the, the slide deck back up? And I, I think I'll cover that and then we'll, uh, we'll okay. get to some Q&A. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share with everyone, you know, kind of our journey through federate moderate equivalency, what we've done uh, to date, where we stand, um, and where we expect to be uh, hopefully very soon. Um, and, and again, just to reiterate, you know, this is a really high bar. Uh, we thought we were setting the bar, the, the bar very high when we went and worked with a, an accredited 3PAO, a FedRAMP 3PAO, um, just to get our, our attestation. You know, if you go back 18 months ago, there was never any um, requirement for this. The first definition of federate moderate equivalency was simply that you had a body of evidence uh, and you had a shared responsibility matrix. In fact, if you reference CMMC, uh, I believe that's still the language that's in there. So the memo does contradict, um, you know, the, the CMMC requirements um, in some regards. But regardless, we are moving forward, assuming that the memo, you know, is what we are held against. Um, I'll add that having a good certified FedRAMP 3PAO is essential. You simply cannot go through this process without one. Um, in fact, they'll be the one that leads a lot of the discussion, you know, if you ever do go in front of DIPCAC. Um, as we covered, if someone tells you that they're hosted in a FedRAMP cloud, their application is hosted in a FedRAMP cloud, and that application is either storing, processing, transmitting CUI, or is one of these new security protection assets, um, you know, that does not equal equivalent. That that's hopefully is, is very clear. Um, and I will just add that our own journey, it's been a significant investment, um, not only in new technology, um, but especially on the resource side. Um, we started this project, I would say, in earnest about 24 months ago, um, and we weren't starting from scratch. We had already gone down the path towards FedRAMP moderate equivalent. Um, we were about halfway there. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of work to do, but we had worked with a, a different 3PAO. Um, we, we switched 3PAOs about 24 months ago. Um, and we've had one person working on this full time for the last two years, uh, along with five to six additional resources working on it part time. We estimated it, it's probably been about two and a half, you know, full time employees just working on our FedRAMP uh, moderate equivalents for the last two years. It included re-architecting our back end. I'm not going to get into all the very, very specifics, um, but it's been a significant you know, investment and, and a significant project for us. Um, and we've been leaning on our 3PAO you know, throughout the process. Um, and at the same time, the 3PAO has been very strict with us because their reputation is on the line. As Marashi mentioned, um, you know, this is, is something new for the industry as a whole. And so the C, the, the three PAO, you know, has been um, very rigorous with with all of our reporting, all of our scans. Um, you know, we're working with them um, consistently. So where are we today? Um, we did present our initial uh, body of evidence to DIBCAC early this month, um, and that was uh, close to two thousand pages. Uh, it did take them some time to review. Uh, we actually had a review meeting with them uh, late last, uh, sorry, early last week, um, and there were a few things that they wanted reformatted. They had a, a couple questions for our three PAO to answer. Um, it was a, a very productive meeting. I wasn't personally in the meeting, um, but my understanding is it was a very productive meeting. DIPCAC, you know, has assured us that they want to see us successful. They want to see other CSPs successful, even knowing that the bar is very high. Um, I will add that we do not have any outstanding POAMs for our 853 um, controls. Um, so, you know, it can be done. It, it wasn't easy, but it, it can be done. Um, and we actually just submitted our revised BOE with everything, including everything our 3PAO needed to add in. Um, I think that was yesterday. So we're, we're hoping to hear back from DIBCAC here, um, you know, any day now on, on where we stand. Marcy, I think you actually had asked the question about um, how are they viewing open POAMs that are found through, let's say, the scans versus POAMs that relate directly to, to 853. Um, and the answer that I got that I've heard from our team is that as long as we're addressing those within our 
security policy within our SSP uh, timeline that, that those are acceptable. So if a, a scan oh. comes up, find something, you know, we have to fix it if it's within our SLA for fixing that. Um, but that that is where you're allowed, you know, because that's part of the, the continuous monitoring process, which is still part of FedRAMP. So, you know, we, we obviously have to uh, participate in that as well. That's really positive. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I hope that maybe there's clarity provided around that as well. Just, um, and, you know, I know internally we've been talking about how we can um, you know, tweak our reports to kind of draw out those findings separate from like legitimate control findings and that type of thing. Right. Um, and we actually got a question that closely relates to this. If you don't mind, if I if I bring that up here. Sure, please um, do. Yeah, perfect. I think we're ready to move into the Q and A portion. Okay. You no, know, thank you. So we did get a question in the um, about compliance scans um, specifically for some of the new scanning requirements within RAV5. I would say that yes, like this comes into play. Um, compliance scans could be those um, scanning related findings that could be documented in a report. But Jamie gives me hope um, in, in Prevail's experience that um, perhaps those would not be considered impactful to that 100% compliance. Um, the only caveat to that I would say is um, within Ref5, we are required to tie compliance scan um, failures to specific controls if it's in the benchmark or the stake for that. So that might be the only nuance is if it then kind of, you know, for example, like AC6, if it ticks AC6 from implemented to, to not or partial, that might be the nuance. But I imagine that I hope that that shakes out over time and, and we get confirmation of, of how those should be handled. I, I will add, we are being... Um, assessed against uh, Rev four, so because we started this process a while ago, and we uh, we got approval from the FedRAMP PMO that we could continue working towards Rev four. So when we go towards Rev five, naturally, you know, we'll we'll have to make some of those changes. And our team is very excited to go to Rev five, as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> okay, um, so we did have some some questions that were sent in earlier, so I, I think we'll start with those. Um, and then we've had some questions that were um, just asked outside of the one that, that Marcy, that you took. Um, and if people have any other questions, you know, feel free to, to put those in. They don't have to be FedRAMP or, or FedRAMP moderate equivalent related. They can be anything, CMMC, DFARS, NIST, all those good questions. Um, but I think the first one, um, I'll probably take this Marcy just because the less, um, you know, we don't want to put you on the spot, but um, one of the questions that came in earlier was, is it better to become compliant through a third party or in-house? Um, since you have a little bit of a, a vested interest in this, I'll answer this from our perspective, what we're telling customers. Um, so I think, you know, there's a couple things to, to unpack here. First of all, um, become compliant through third party or in-house. I assume if you're talking about getting ready for compliance, because you can't self-certify. You can self-attest to compliance, but you cannot self-certify yourself to be compliant. Um, so if you did want to go through the certification process, you would have to work with a firm um, such as Marcy's. You would have to work with a, a C through PAO. Um, we're talking, assuming CMMC level two, um, because there is no certification for level one, you do self-assess to level one. Um, and, and so my recommendation to companies when they're starting this process is I would always recommend that you do work with a third party that has expertise in this, particularly a C3PAO, um, or you know, if there's a consultant that has a, a really strong reputation, you can do that as well. Um, but yeah, I would always recommend working with an expert because you know you're going to get the answers, you know, the right answers versus what you may think is right. And then you turn out that you're actually making more work for yourself. So I think in the long run, you know, it may save you certainly time and, and potentially money as well. Um, and the nice thing about it is you can go, you know, work with a C3BAO to do either call it a, some call it a gap, some call it a readiness assessment to assess where you are today. Um, and then I would recommend using that same one, you know, to be your CMMC official assessor when the time comes, obviously they can't consult you on what they find. You would have to either fix that in-house or bring in a third party. Um, but when you do then, you know, use that third party again for your assessment, you know, they should already have an understanding of your organization, your documentation, and then hopefully it reduces the effort, you know, the second time. Um, they do, as Marcy, I'm sure will point out, they do have to do a full assessment the second time, but 
Marcy, would you agree that it, it sh typically should be a bit smoother of an effort? Yeah, definitely. There is some efficiency gained because we're not um, learning the environment. We're not learning the people um, and the processes from scratch. So we come in with a, a solid foundation um, and for if we're coming in for the second time, so to speak. Excellent. Marcy, I, I've got a question here that I think will be a good one for you, uh, especially I know Shellman has worked with some primes in the past. So just in, in your experiences with CMMC, what are some of the biggest challenges primes are facing in implementation of CMMC within their orgs? Um, and are any of these, you know, kind of uniform across the board? I think we're yeah. talking about larger orgs at this point. Yeah, definitely. And to be honest, I feel like these, uh, the ones I'll touch on are kind of prevalent no matter the size of the organization. They're just difficult technical controls to implement. Um, and sometimes you feel like you might be running in circles because you're reliant on another standard. So, um, and, and, I, you know, we've heard um, the DCMA um, folks and assessors talk about this when they've presented previously, but um, two kind of control areas. One is, is with encryption. So um, specifically the requirement to use FIPS validated cryptography for data at rest, data in transit, um, remote access. So that it, it's just, it's a high bar um, depending on the amount of components in your environment that are you know, handling CUI in that capacity. Um, and, and FIPS is always that certification um, is kind of, la or validation is lagging behind. So vendors who, let's say, let's take a firewall, for example, who are sending that firewall and that crypto module within that firewall through the uh, validation process at NIST to get FIPS 140-2 or dash three validated, um, it takes time. They have to go through laboratory testing. Um, and then maybe there's something that comes out that, um, since that one historical, uh, we had a huge transition back in 2022 related to that. So FIPS kind of feels like you're running in circles. Um, and so that is always a very difficult one to meet, to meet. And the bigger the environment or the mo more complex the environment, the harder it is because the more components we're having to evaluate against that specific requirement. Um, another area is just strictly with multi-factor authentication um, and thinking about MFA across all of the different access paths. So um, how, um, let's say it's an, you know, an enclave or even uh, an organization's full kind of IT infrastructure, maybe that's the full scope. Um, just thinking about you know, the employees, um, how, how many different ways can they access the systems? Um, if you are serving anything to your customer, can, can they access it via some sort of you know, user interface. Um, so that any of the access controls as well as the identi identity controls, those apply across all of the different access paths. And that just gets more difficult with multi-factor authentication. But what if the CEO doesn't want to use MFA, Marcy? <laughs> so sorry you know like you know I, the auditor can deliver the bad news i always say like we don't make the requirements we just are the messenger on what they are and whether you're meeting them or not so um you can you can blame the assessor as kind of the bad person in that situation we hear it though <laughs> so i had a, a question um earlier and and this has also kind of been a hot topic um can you please clarify the difference between CSP and ESP requirements? I'm assuming this person is asking relative to the, the CMMC ecosystem, because I think that's really where ESP was introduced. Um, my take on it is that, you know, and, and I know there's, there's been some discussion back and forth on where does the line, when does a, an ESP become a CSP, I, I think is the line of demarcation that we're all really kind of interested in. Obviously, you know, somebody like a Prevail, we're clearly a CSP. Um, we have to be treated as such. We need to be federal moderate equivalent because we store, process, transmit CUI. Um, you know, but I, I'd love your perspective on this too, Marcy, where ESP is such a broad category. It is, it is. And I would say, um, so kind of, just drawing the line between the two, uh, a cloud service provider, um, I, I mentioned the, the federal definition of, of cloud um, reference document is NIST 800-145. There are like the tenants of, of cloud. Um, but if you're serving like a an offering, a, a web-based offering, it's a really good way to kind of like 
think yes or no. Um, if you're providing like a SaaS, anything like that, then you would be considered a cloud service provider in that situation versus um, maybe you're just making parts. Like you're, you're a sub to a prime, they're sending you schematics and, and diagrams and such, and, and you're manufacturing things for them. Um, that is obviously very different. You're not, you're not providing any sort of, of cloud-based service to them. Um, and then when it comes to like the actual like assessment um, burden and requirement there, obviously for if you're a CSP, that would be FedRAMP. Um, and then if you're an external um, service provider that, that's not cloud, um, you would be required to go through CMMC. And Marcy, what if it's a managed services provider, managed security service services provider, who let's say manages uh, a cloud-based SIM or a cloud-based vulnerability management service for their customer? I'm trying to throw you a curveball here. Yeah, I this question, um, I I wasn't rolling my eyes. I was like looking up to think because it's it's complex, and I always get kind of like twisted with the terminology. Um, but if you're a managed service provider, I think about who is actually owning that system. So if um, OSCA has this cloud-based SIM um, that they're using, and they're using a managed service provider to help them um, manage alerts, they're receiving the alerts and, and triaging, um, that would just be a managed security, that, they would, that would not be a cloud service because they're not actually providing that SIM capability. Um, a cloud service provider would be, if it's a cloud-based SIM, um, that it would be that, that separate entity. Um, now that, that provider, the MSP or MSSP in that case, may be involved in OSCA's you know, CMMC certification because they're helping that OSC perform control activities related to that, the AU family, for example. Um, and, and depending on if they're actually storing or processing or transmitting that data within the MSP's organization, then potentially that MSP would require um, or would be would be required to undergo CMMC as well. So it's all about the data. Like where is the data going? Who is owning the data? Who's touching the data? Who's kind of the data? Um, yeah, it's, it's all about the data. And, and to that point too, it's all about who owns the systems that the data is touching, right? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I think that, that's important. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we got time for maybe one more here. Um, it's a good kind of um, less less technical question, but but I think I do hear this quite a bit as well. Is how do I know if I'm going to be required to become certified if I'm not directly bidding, but customers I provide in this example crates do does? Um, will my customer then need need me to be uh, certified? So I think this is maybe, you know, if I'm a sub to a sub to a, a prime, when do I know if I'm going to need to be certified versus not being certified? And I don't claim to be a contracting, contracting expert. Um, what we have seen, however, is that most primes are having this conversation with their subs um, and you know, CMMC has been kind of in process for some time now, so they've had time to have those conversations or inform. Another another way to think about this is if you have an existing DFARS 7012 clause in your contract, or that's been flowed down to you in any capacity, then you would need you would then be required long term to undergo CMMC. Like that that requirement would would be um, passed down to you. Um, there is like kind of a ramp in period for when CMMC becomes. Um, that when the when the rule is final and CMMC is real, so to speak, um, it won't be everything all at once. Not all contracts suddenly flip over to having the CMMC requirement. But I always use that um, that 7012 clause in an existing contract as a really good indicator. And then if you're receiving data that's marked as CUI, you should and and you don't know if you have that 7012 clause, you should be reaching out to your prime or whoever you are doing business with to say, hey, do you know, am I going to have this requirement? This is Mark CUI. What do we need to be doing to prepare? What's going to be the future requirement for, for us as a sub? And what if you flip that around, Marcy? What if you're not receiving CUI, but you have a DFARS 7012 con, uh, clause? What would you then say, or even a CMMC clause at some point? Yeah, I would go to the contracting officer and say, 
hey, you've, you've given us this requirement, but we're not handling CUI. They may double down and say, nope, this clause stays. Um, uh, but that would I would recommend just having that discussion. And they may very well say, well, we could, and the perf depending on what work is being performed in the execution of that contract, you you might handle CUI. You may not right now, but you could in, in three months. Um, and so they may say, well, we're preparing for that. So we want you to be able to demonstrate that if we did send you CUI, you it would be protected per the, the standards and requirements. Perfect. Thanks, Marcy. Okay. I think um, we got through the majority of the questions. I know time is just about up here. Um, one thing we always do, Marcy, is I always have our guest pick the best question that was submitted, and uh, that person does uh, receive a $25 Starbucks gift card. So uh, just to go through the, the questions that came in today, Marcy, I'm putting you on the spot because you don't know <laughs> who sent the, these in, and, and I do. Um, we had uh, the most recent question, which was about um, what we'll just call that kind of supply chain. You know, when do I know if I need to be certified? Um, we had the question about um, the difference between a CSP and an ESP. Um, we had the question... Um, the other one that you answered about compliance scans that was Rev5 related. We had a question about um, becoming compliant through a third party or through my own in-house. And then um, what kind of challenges, you know, are you seeing um, specifically to primes, but really across the board with, with uh, the assessments that you're going through? So I know that was a lot. So again, assessments, um, should I become compliant? with a third party or in-house, CSP versus ESP, supply chain, compliance scans? Um, man, this is a tough choice. I feel like I'd have to go for the difference between CSP and ESP, because I those waters have been so muddled for so long. Um, and you know I think they're starting to clear and things are making a bit more sense. So I like that because I feel like there's a, a just a lot of, um, uh, additional education that's needed within the entire div just to ensure folks are, are on the right path. So I, I like that answer. And I will point out, I saw recently on, on LinkedIn, uh, Robert Metzger, who's, who's very well known in, in the industry. Um, we actually had him on a webinar with us last week. He's, he's one of the premier uh, cybersecurity attorneys and, and compliance attorneys uh, in the country. Had a great LinkedIn post specifically about CSPs, ESPs, MSPs, uh, throw in a few more SPs in there, but um, <laughs> I would highly recommend people go read that, get his interpretation on it. You know, we are still in the open comment period for CMMC, so feel free to submit your comments if you have questions around that. I think the general consensus is, you know, we do need a little more clarity around that. So uh, with that said, thanks everyone for uh, attending this month's Coffee and Compliance. Um, look forward to uh, seeing you next month and uh, really uh, thank you for, for joining us, Marcy. thought you had some great perspective on federal moderate equivalency and I always appreciate your expertise. And if people want to get in touch with you, um, how can they contact you or, or Shelman? Yeah, um, cmmc at shellman.com. Um, Orly just had this up on the screen. So feel free to grab a, grab a screenshot of this. Um, uh, this is the, the easiest way to ensure that you get in contact with, with our team. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Marcy. Thanks, Orly. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Me. Bye. Take care.